I'm so delighted because uh, here at NAM I ran into an old friend of mine, Barry Henderson, who is the founder of Is Technology and the inventor of, in my opinion, the world's greatest recording system, the radar. Barry, thank you for coming and please uh, give us all a history of the radar so we can document it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. Really appreciate uh, having this chat with you on the roof of the 2020 NAM convention. You and I have been coming to this show for countless times. And um, I met Nick many years ago when he became a radar customer. He became one of my best uh, customers of radar, gave, gave lots of great feedback on the product. So the story of radar kind of begins uh, when I was in university taking electrical engineering in University of Waterloo in Ontario. And uh, I really wanted to do something different for the music industry. Um, in, in back in those days, uh, engineering and the arts were considered two disciplines that really didn't have much to do with each other. I remember going to the dean of elect, uh, dean of engineering at University of Waterloo and and saying that I would like to take a course called Music 275G, the history of music and computers, and I really wanted to learn about music and audio and computers and technology and how it all work together and what's been tried in the past and what could be done in the future. And um, so the Dean of Engineering said, well, you know, the arts, they don't really contribute much to society. I mean, engineering, we build bridges, we design technology, we send people to the moon. But, you know, the arts programs, if, if you want to philosophize or that sort of thing, that's but we don't really give credit for that. And I really wanted to get a credit for this course, Music 275G. So I said to him, well, you know, uh, the last, you know, in the, in the music and audio industry, it, it borrows technology from all the industries, telecommunications, medical, military, you know, switching power supplies, serial ports like RS-232. They're all borrowed technologies. MIDI is just RS-232 on steroids, just basically a serial port sped up. I said to, to the dean, I would like to invent something in the audio world that could be bored and taken out into the other industries instead of the other way around. And so uh, I said the last real piece of technology in the audio industry that, that was really invented for audio was basically the loudspeaker in the late 1800s. And uh, so I'd like to make a difference in, in, the, in the world. And uh, I wore him down, I argued with him for probably an hour, and he finally said, okay, fine, you can take the course and you can get the credit in engineering. But I've always been into music, I love music. Um, fast forward, when I got my first full-time job out west in Vancouver, um, the first thing I did was push the company towards music products. And the first product we, we invented under my leadership was the Anatech MIDI uh, Merge. It was called the Pocket Merge and it took two MIDI signals and merged them into one. And uh, musicians hate batteries and wall warts, as we all know. And so I thought, well, let's just run the thing off the MIDI signal. And everybody told me that was impossible, but we figured out how to extract a little bit of current from the MIDI signal and run the whole thing off MIDI. So we had a little box that we sold for $100, crash-proof. You could send two keyboards with sysx dumps and pitch benders on all 16 MIDI channels reams and reams of data on two MIDI inputs, merge them together out of one output, and never ever get a crash. It was the perfect product. It had one LED, no buttons, the user interface didn't require any learning or any knowledge whatsoever. And what I learned through that experience is, if you make a product, don't make it engineering driven, make it user driven, and make it as simple, as brain dead easy as possible, so that when people get it out of the box, it's obvious how to use it, and they don't have to read anything. So I had a recording studio, I had a Studer A80, I had a Sound Workshop Series uh, 34 uh, analog console. It wasn't very deep and so it could fit in my small garage control room. And it, I bought that off of Jim Valance, the co-writer with Brian Adams. He, he moved up to a $1.5 million SSL and I paid him $30,000 for his uh, Sound Workshop console, which he used to write several Brian Adams songs. I had a Studer A80, a Studer A80 or 24 track, a Studer A82 track, and a Studer A807 mix down machine, some Neumanns and all the trimmings. Um, 
it didn't take me long to get clients in the studio and I literally watched people get out a razor blade, take two inch tape, lay it on the cutting block, slice, and these are guys, that, I don't know how they did it, they were artists, true artists, slice a very 1 24th of a piece of tape, pick it up, move it over an eighth of an inch to get a kick drum in the right place, and then tape it back down and put it back on the reel, run it through the tape machine, and I thought, we live in a digital age, and that's how people are editing audio. So I got the idea for this 24 track hard disk, random access digital audio recorder device. Didn't exist. Pro Tools was a two track editor at the time, barely. And um, within two years, we had developed Radar the world's first 24-track hard disk recorder. It had three one-gig hard drives. Each hard drive was uh, $1,500. So it took three gigabytes of hard drive to store 15 minutes of music at 48 kilohertz. And um, that was $4,500 in cost of the unit, just those three hard drives. We sold it for $15,000 US, put it up against a Studer, a Notari MTR90, um, some of the Mitsubishi machines, and it just sounded absolutely killer. The, the audio was so incredibly warm and, and big, and it just sounded great. So we made this box, 19 inch rack, you could throw it in the back seat of your car, which you couldn't do with a two inch tape machine, 500 pounds the size of a washing machine. And uh, it was by and large rejected by the majority of recording studio owners because they weren't ready for it. They didn't understand it. They just thought, well, we record on tape. We don't, we can't even see reels moving or tape moving through a mechanism. We, how can we trust this thing? Um, but slowly radar gained traction and became a standard. It became a standard in Nashville uh, within a few years. Uh, before long, there were over 200 studios in Nashville running radar. And so we sold worldwide overall time close to 5,000 radars they went into professional studios U2 people recording them on, on like Bob Dylan Neil Young um, Gordon Lightfoot did all his later albums all on radar so one of the things the technologically for those of you that are interested in technology that we did that that was unique was the power supply now this is often the overlooked technology which is how do you make really good clean power um, and how do you fit it in a small space well really the only way to fit power lots of power in a small space and if you're going to drive 24 channel outputs at 600 ohm loads um, you're going to need a re recent, reasonable amount of power and if you're going to run all those a to d and d to a converters with plus or minus 18 volt rails not plus or minus 12 or plus or minus 15 which is in the majority of all A to D and D to A converters on the market today, but plus minus 18 volt rails, 24 channels in and out, high quality converters that heat up and generate a lot of heat, you need good power. So uh, we, of course, we thought switching power supply, it's the only way to do it. But the problem with switching power supplies is they switch at about 100 kilohertz and they just chop up the, the, the power so that it can run at a high speed through a small, small transformer and that's how you get the weight down, the power to weight ratio gets maximized. Well, that generates tons of noise. When you switch that much power that quickly, there's noise and harmonics flying all throughout the box. And low pass filters and bypass capacitors aren't enough. They're Filter not. Capacitors are not enough to be able to. They're not going to cut it. And we knew that. And people that were advising me at the time in, in Vancouver, these guys all told me, you can't do that. You can't get audio that clean inside a box with that many channels in and out running off a switching power supply. We synchronized the switching frequency. We designed our own switching power supply to the sample rate. So when the samples took place on sample boundaries, so did the noise, uh, sorry, the samples took place between the sample boundaries. When the sample rate switched, that's where the noise of the switching power supply occurred. The noise, all the noise disappeared. It's perfectly clean. As far as I'm aware, nobody in the audio and digital audio industry has ever done that before. Because today you're gonna buy a switching power supply from wherever you can get the cheapest one, even a good quality one, you're not gonna have an, 
a synchronizing input signal that comes from your sample clock on that power supply, especially one that switches up through all sample rate ranges without degrading the quality. All the A to D converters and D to A, con a, D to a converters, they weren't built on fiberglass printed circuit boards the way they are today. They were built on ceramic substrate hybrids. So this is a technology that comes from the military that allows you to screen print all the conductors with palladium silver, screen print all the resistors with ruthenium oxide, and all of the com most of the components, there are some surface mount components on a hybrid, but most of the components are become part of the um, alumina substrate, the ceramic substrate, which acts like a heat sink because it's sort of basically like a metal and you don't get any hot spots and then you laser trim all the resistors with a laser beam to a precise 0.01% tolerance. So you don't have to buy you know, an expensive chip resistor that might cost a penny and then if, if you want really, really tight tolerance, it might cost five cents. Now you can just print some ink for 0 0.0001 cents and then actively with power, with power and audio passing through, actively laser trim it so that fit all the phase relationships and everything are perfect. Just like you screen print a t-shirt, yeah. you get a, but it's a stainless steel screen, not a, um, it's a stainless steel mesh, not a, not a canvas kind of a mesh. And it's really, really highly accurate. And then you, instead of like with a copper PC board, you take, fiberglass, you coat it with copper both sides, then you put a photographic mask on there, put a photographic emulsion, a mask, expose it, wash it all away, and then you etch it with hydrochloric acid. The, instead of, that's how printed circuit boards are made to this day. It's a very chemical intensive, caustic, uh, dirty process. And um, what we did was we took queen, a clean white piece of ceramic substrate, screen print the conductors, right, with palladium silver, right. put them through the furnace like you're firing a pottery, a piece of pottery in a kiln, put the ceramic with the screen printed con silver, con palladium silver conductors through a furnace at 6,000 degrees, it turns like the ceramic's like almost white hot, and it comes out, the, the conductors are fired right into the ceramic. Then you do the same thing with resistors. So you got two conductors coming together, and there's a little gap between there, you screen print, a square of ruthenium oxide, which is a resistive material. And you get a resistor, say, one kilo ohms. If you want two kilo ohms, you make it twice as long, etc. And then you, you cut into it with a laser beam, running really slowly, like zzzz, and you're actively measuring the resistor passive for passively, and then in circuit with audio passing through, measuring on oscilloscopes, so that you, there's no trim pots. There's no trim pots to tweak after you've built the board. It's all done actively trimmed in circuit and it's all flat on a piece of ceramic. There's no surface mount components yet. Then you have ICs, like A to D, D to A converts, surface mount components. Some of the capacitors, serve, we do some of the capacitors screen printed, but most of them are chip caps, like surface mount capacitors. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's kind of a hybrid, that's why it's called a hybrid. It's literally called a thick film hybrid because this, the ink is thick and it's printed on a ceramic substrate. So it's a hybrid of surface mount PC boards, but there is no PC board, it's only ceramic substrate, and then screen printed resistors, and the resistors have a lower noise because you don't have the, the uh, electrons going through copper, then through solder, then through uh, other materials with solder and lead, and then through silver plated end pieces, and then through other, comp you don't have all that. You just have palladium silver, ruthenium oxide, and that's it. And it's all centered through the firing process, so it all becomes one. So low noise, low temperature, no hot spots, and really, really accurate resistors. So we put all this technology into radar. Nobody knows all this stuff. This is probably, possibly, being heard for the first time. That technology of the, of the ceramic hybrids is radar one. So if you want to pull a radar apart and look for these ceramic substrate-based A to D, D to A converter hybrids, do it on it. Just take the lid off of radar one, look on the analog cards. You'll see them right there. Um, in the later versions, the surface mount technology got to the point where we could, we could do it for you know about the same cost and still get the quality and um, 
the, the, the ceramic substrate based hybrids it is a very expensive process. So, uh, but that, those are the kinds of things that we did to, to get that sound, to make sure it sounded really warm. We wanted the user to be happy. We wanted to just put it in front of them and without even reading the instruction manual, I've had blind people like Stevie Wonder or others come up to the user interface within five, I'm placing his hands on the keys, there's no mouse, within five minutes, he's running a session on a radar. So that's how easy radar was to use. Super easy, sounded great, very inexpensive compared to the technology of the day. And uh, so as time went on, we got into the late 2000s, uh, you know, uh, the industry has moved in a different direction. People don't care as much about sound quality by and large. There are still pockets of those who absolutely won't won't take anything less than amazing quality, but by and large the industry is more about other things. Um, and um, so it became more and more difficult to, uh, to continue the radar style of product. Um, and so in 2017, I decided to kind of go back to my contract manufacturing roots and I sold the radar business to uh, the current owner, which, who was my partner at the time. And um, he, uh, he's continuing the legacy, he's continuing to bear the torch of radar and continue the legacy. And uh, I think he's working on some new products as well. Um, but I've moved into a role of building a whole business unit, uh, taking everything I've learned from radar development and distribution and manufacturing and research and development, taking all that and applying it towards to help other companies. And right now we're building products for other companies. And so we're basically in the contract manufacturing business. And uh, so that's what I'm doing here at the 2020 NAM, having a lot of fun just going around to all my old friends who used to be in some ways competitors, um, some in some cases complementary to radar. And, uh, and now going back to the, into the industry and saying, hey, we can take some of this great quality manufacturing experience that we've had over the last 30 years, apply it to your products. And so it's a lot of fun working with, working still in the industry and making use of everything we learned from radar. Um, Barry, that's an incredible uh, treatise on the hardware side of things. Before I let you go, uh, I want to drill down on the software and a little bit more on the sure. user experience of this of this ses of the session controller, sure, which is an amazing piece of hardware. So, talk a little bit about the operating system sure. that you chose, BIOS, you know, pre-radar studio, and how it is that that worked, and you know how the, you can actually run the thing without a computer screen at all. I think that's a really important thing for people to understand. Sure, absolutely. Uh, a really important thing to me is customer's user experience. Now, one of the things that people do with tape machines is called a punch-in. They'll either do a manual punch-in or they'll do an auto punch. And so they'll mark the in and the out, and they'll run it back, hit play, they'll set that, turn on the auto punch, and then just keep repeating it over until the guy nails it. And that's a performance-based punch some guys just say, no, I want to try it again. So there's where the punch in comes, the auto punch, and it works seamlessly on radar. How do you do that? You have to have an operating system that is deterministic, which means it has deterministic latencies. So that means that if you have a thousand things, a thousand little subroutines and little loops simultaneously running the screen, running the mouse, running the keyboard, running all the various things, um, in an operating system, something like Windows does not have deterministic latencies. That means that a process has to complete before another process can start. And if you just crank up the, the speed of the CPU, it'll be fast enough and you can move the mouse and the cursor will move instantly and you'll never notice it, like pause for a minute or there'll be a glitch. But if there's too many things going on, if you have audio software running and there that's taking high priority latency on sample rates and things like that and you have plugins running you're going to start to notice that operating system slow down in a in an operating system that has deterministic latencies you can the programmer can say i want this operation to occur within three clock cycles or within you know half a millisecond guaranteed so the, so the operating system gives you that option of guaranteeing a latency. You'll never ever have a visible 
delay, and that means down at the digital audio level, you'll never have a pop or a click or a glitch. And so that was really important to us. So we looked at Linux. Linux is also does not also does not have deterministic latencies, but you can get plugins that give it that capability. That was a little bit messy. Windows wouldn't work. Uh, we looked at um, Qnix, which later got bought by BlackBerry, and it's an operating system used in the automotive industry. It's a real-time operating system with deterministic latencies, and it's used in the automotive industry for appliances, radios, dashboard controls, all kinds of things. Um, but it was really, really expensive on a per unit uh, basis. We wanted something that was either free or, you know, a buck a a buck a system or something like that. So we picked BIOS, which which was a real-time operating system designed for multimedia. And as soon as we picked it and designed it into the radar, the company went out of business. So we did get a hold of the source code. We we uh, rewrote portions of it, customized it for our needs, and we called it IZOS, I Z O S. Um, and so it's BIOS based. But we called it ISOS, and it, when the radar boots up, it has the IS logo on at the beginning instead of BIOS. So the operating system is the first thing. The second thing is the digital engine that has the clock, the phase lock loop that runs at the sample rate, and all of the other digital processors moving data from this buffer to that buffer. It's all done on sample clock-based timing in order that there's never a glitch or never a pop anytime ever in radar. And so we had to write firmware for DSP chips. We used a Motorola DSP on the adrenaline board. We had to write um, a real time a watchdog and operating system level uh, timers for all of the uh, recording functions. So as the adrenaline board and the converters are all working together to send digital audio, 24-bit digital audio to a 32-bit and later on a 64-bit computer bus, all of those software routines and all of that recording engine was totally independent of the BIOS operating system but worked in conjunction with its real-time deterministic latency features uh, to be able to record audio and display the waveforms in real time right on. I think Pro Tools to this day still, when you're in record, the waveforms are lagging behind That's right. the cursor a little bit. They've never been able to get it. Radar has always been right at the cursor as as the waveforms are moving. It's like they're just flowing out of the cursor. Um, and it's always fast and real time and doesn't have any delays or lags or anything like that. And I used to punch on this thing. I used to punch in and out like this. Like, really, really fast on 24 tracks at 192 kilohertz. And and I do it like maybe 30,000 punches, punch in outs, and then I'd hit stop. And it would process all the punch ins in about a second. And then it'd be ready to go into play. Every other machine on the market, would, they're grinding away on processing everything you just did, taking that playlist and applying it to all the digital audio, linking the playlist to all the little snippets of audio files that were just recorded. And Radar never did that. People were just amazed. What? It's done? I can hit play now? Yeah. And things like that. So I would go crazy like a wild man because the reason I would do that is because if I find a little timing window that nobody would ever find, it, people don't punch 30,000 times in, in four minutes. They don't do that. But I would find a timing window that would expose a bug by doing that really high stress thing and then they'd fix it in software and then I could never re reproduce again. I know that nobody ever is going to find that in the field. So I would be really a wild crazy person literally doing river dance on the radar keyboard you know to just find weird problems and so really testing it the software thoroughly and then taking it back so oh Barry found six more bugs when we thought we had tested all our code and so that's really really key to have somebody in the organization that has that much determination and dedication to, to uncover the software bugs. Does that help 
explain the operating system a bit? The level of complexity under the hood that the end user never sees because of the incredible minuscule levels of, of control that you are having over what it is over the process of creating this thing in the yeah. first place. I think the other thing that's really important just to say for people who've never used a radar is you don't even need that waveform display. It's great, and we're used to you know, a world in which you see you know, waveforms and things on a computer screen, but it's really important to mention that the session controller itself has got an LCD display on it, and you can sit there and never look at a computer screen and do all of your edits with your ears instead of your eyes, and that's one of the beautiful... Tell me about another workstation of any kind that you can do that on today. Yeah, it's almost like we took the pocket merge user interface of one LED and said, let's try to make that the UI, the GUI for radar. Well, we didn't quite get it that simple, but yeah, one 16 character LCD display and uh, illuminated transport controls and tracker, and you can run a whole session with yeah, that. It's incredible. It's really amazing. Barry, thank you so much. I do want to uh, point out one other thing for people who don't currently have a radar system. Well, there are two things. First of all, they're still in production, so you can buy a new one if you want. But on Reverb.com and eBay, I see Radar 24s, you know, with all the trimmings on sale for a couple few thousand bucks yeah. these days. And I think that might be an interesting thing for folks who want to explore this to look at. So along those lines, I would be nervous buying a radar system not knowing whether I had any support about it. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, I do know that uh, uh, Raymond Lamb, who was the builder and repairer person for radar at his technology for many, many years, has now started his own business. And also, if you go to the IS Technology website, www.izcorp.com, and look at the tech support phone numbers, that will get you to Raymond. And he does a great job at, at support. Um, I'm, I also help out. Sometimes I do tech support. If you go to solidaudio.com, you go to that's my website. You'll see a way to contact me there, or just email me Barry at solidaudio.com. Contact us, and we'll help you out. It's my pleasure to uh, have served the industry with this great product for so many years. And um, if anybody wants help, I'd be happy to help them. Okay, so I sold the business in, what was it, June 2017, and I went to work for Ampco, that's what this is all about, and we talked earlier about uh, uh, me getting involved in the, the current music and pro audio industry and doing manufacturing for them and meeting their needs. Um, but it took the industry until 2019 and uh, to recognize that Radar was in fact the world's first digital 24 track hard disk recorder. Um, started shipping back in the early 90s, 1991, 1992. And uh, so last year's NAM, 2019, I did receive the Tech Hall of Fame induction award. Uh, George Peterson presented the award. And that was that was really special because you know it took the industry. You know when we first did radar, a lot of people kind of poo pooed it and said, uh, "What do we need this for?" And then after a few years, it was gaining acceptance. But you know the first prototypes we ever made, we threw them out. You know you you just don't think they're going to be of any value. And then 30 years later, the industry saying, "Wait, wait a second! This was the world's first 24-track hard disk recorder made by this little company up in Canada." And then they were presented the, the award. And uh, so that was really exciting to get that award back in back at last year's NAM. Well, Barry Henderson, thank you so much for your time. You're, you're such a fine man. I mean, I know a lot about you personally as well. And I have to say that it is an honor to call you my friend. Okay, thank you so much. much. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for... Have a great show.